Welcome everybody to the Three Gun Show. I'm your host Dave Hartman, and where the heck have I been? I'm back. This is episode 287 of the Three Gun Show, and uh, yeah, we're back. We're, we got a, a bunch more Three Gun Show podcasts for you here, and this one that you're going to be listening to is a uh, is a podcast about the Wyoming Governor's match. Um, Funny, funny thing at the Wyoming Governor's match. So many of you um, came up to me and uh, and said, "Dave, where's the show been?" And I thought to myself, "Well, it hasn't been that long." And I looked at the last time the show came out, and it'd been like four months. And then even then, recorded this one uh, a few weeks ago, and just haven't got it out yet. Life has been so busy, which I guess busy is like a shitty excuse for I just haven't done it. Um, I don't like the I don't like the excuse busy because it implies that you're not in control. I don't like that excuse. However, I have been busy. <laughs> um, as most of you know, I I got my dream job. I'm the marketing manager at Stag Arms, and uh, so far on the marketing team, there's one of us. We're trying to hire more. We've got job job uh, requisitions out there. Um, if any of you are marketing people, hit me up. Um. But so far, it's uh, it's just me. And so um, I work with uh, some contractors to contract some things out. But uh, other than that, everything you see out of Stag Arms right now and for the last eh, like six, seven months has been me. And then um, I guess that's me trying to justify why I haven't got the podcast out. But I guess what I'm, I'm really trying to say here is uh, I'm sorry. It's been a long time. I know you can on the show. I know that. For most of you, this brings joy to your week. So, I'm sorry I haven't done it in a while. Um, from the uh, from the folks that I talked to at uh, the Wyoming Governor's Match, uh, sounds like you you missed the three gun show in your life. Uh, a couple of you seem to miss me in your life, which was really uh, it was great to hear. It felt good, um, but then it also made me feel like I was slacking. <laughs> Um, I ran into a gentleman and I won't, um, won't say his name here. I won't embarrass him, but, um, you know, he said that, um, you know, he's listened to every single episode of the three gun show and then to have it just suddenly go away was, uh, was like losing touch with a friend and then, uh, not knowing what happened to that friend. So I'm good. I'm, uh, I'm still living in Cheyenne, Wyoming, still accompanied by my best dog, Parker. And, um, I've just been doing the, the job thing, um, you know, full time or more and been doing the, uh, the shooting thing. I have been tr- able to travel for a few matches, including Jeff Kirkwell Memorial match, which you'll hear coming up soon. Uh, the, uh, Wyoming governor's match. And then this weekend I have generation three gun coming up. And then we, over the next two months here have so many events for stag that it's, it's insane. So we're going to be super busy. Um, Basically, the firearms industry pushed everything back, like matches and stuff like that, and then just basically crammed everything into September and October. So it's going to be a super busy time for us. And, uh, yeah, in the meantime, uh, got a nice apartment here in Cheyenne. For a lot of you that have been following this a long time, you know that a long time ago, about four years ago, I quit my job, sold everything I owned, and bought a travel trailer, and then traveled around the country shooting three-gun so here's some interesting news. I bought a couch and uh, it took me a long time to do so, um, but I don't know how I feel about that. It's just one more thing you got to move when the time comes or uh, or one more thing, just possessions, you know. So I'll try to keep it light over here as far as uh, uh, non-useful possessions go, but uh, tools and firearms, I've got plenty of room for all that stuff. So kind of rambling here. Um, just because I wanted to give you guys an update on what's going on with uh, with me, uh, for those of you that are curious. Um, it's not easy for me to talk about myself, which is kind of funny because I do a podcast. But uh, for again, if you've listened to the show for quite a while, you know that I generally don't like to talk about myself. Um, I kind of leave it to the guests and then uh, throw my cheap two cents in where I can. But, uh, but yeah, so this is a little bit of a departure. Um, Moving on, let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the podcast coming up. So, I went to the Wyoming Governor's match, 
again. This is the fourth year they've had it, the fourth year I've shot it. Um, this is the second year in Cody, uh, Cody, Wyoming. Um, and for those of you complaining about how far away Cody is to travel to for the match, it's even far when you live in Wyoming. Um, I think, uh, I think the map says it's like six and a half hours from us here in, in uh, Cheyenne, but my boss and I did use the opportunity to go visit some, uh, uh, landmarks in Wyoming and, uh, and bring our rifles and take sweet photos near, uh, uh, some rivers and like some beautiful views and stuff like that to really solidify, uh, stag arms in Cheyenne. And then of course we, uh, uh, stag arms sponsored the match, um, as again, another way to solidify ourselves in, uh, in uh, Wyoming. And the reason we do that is because Wyoming has been amazing to us. And you'll hear us talk about it in the podcast here. And those are my guests that are on the podcast. So when we shot the Wyoming governor's match, it was me. Uh, I was uh, my, uh, my boss, Chad Larson, and one of our um, sales guys, Stephen Bassett. And we had an awesome time. It was a lot of fun. Um, we got to shoot with the Marine um, action shooting team. And that is always a good time. Those guys are good people. We had a fantastic squad. We had an awesome squad mom, which I really like the way USSL does their um, their scorekeeper, how their scorekeeper just stays with you the entire match. I think that's really cool. And overall, just a really fun match that had just the slightest little bit of a damper put on it by COVID restrictions where we didn't have the, uh, you know, the gatherings or the prize table um gathering like we uh like we normally do so it was kind of tough to see everyone that was at the match um but uh but the stages were great we got to shoot a, a fun match and then it was weird we shot morning on the last day and then we had all this time so we just kind of beat feet and uh went to yellowstone which is what tourists do when uh, there's touristy things to do so again i'm rambling i'll stop now go ahead and listen to this three gun show episode with uh, Chad Larson, Stephen Bassett, myself, Dave Hartman, and this is uh, Team Stag Arms. Welcome everybody to the Three Gun Show. A special episode here from Stag Arms headquarters in Cheyenne, Wyoming, with a couple of Stag Arms coworkers here. Stephen, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. Chad, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Great to have you guys on. We just uh, we're fresh. We're back from the Wyoming Governor's match. And we're here to talk about it. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Actually, it was a nice, uh, good, good major match. I had not been out to uh, out to that uh, range before, so it was good to check it out and see it. So, yeah, the uh, was it the Cody sh- Cody shooting range, Cody, Cody shooting Cody. complex, right? There you go, Sh- Cody shooting complex. Yep. Last year when I went there, I was pleasantly surprised at uh, how amazing that range is. Mm-hmm. Is not something I would have expected on the outskirts of Cody. Yeah, it's a yeah, really not nice for. Place. Uh, Town of only ten thousand people uh, <laughs> to have a you know a really a first class range like that. That was that was really impressive. It was really nice to get out there. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. So we're gonna get into um, the whole trip because as we know with three gun, it's all about the uh, the trip and the adventure that that is uh, the the entire three gun weekend as well as the stages. Uh, but first, if you're hearing a little bit of an echo, we're in our conference room. It's not acoustically sound, but it's the quietest place we could find right now. Construction going on downstairs for the new Stag Arms, which is exciting. It is. Yeah, they finally have, finally have started uh, construction demo on our new space, you know, with the whole pandemic thing. Shutting things down, the city wasn't approving permits and stuff, so it just basically put like a three- to four-month pause on all of our plans yeah. to expand, but they're finally getting going on it, so it's great to see that they're – Making some progress, so we're pretty excited about that. It'll really be nice to. We're supposed to be in our new space right now, but right, we're still um, in our temporary offices. Yeah, so hopefully the the new space uh, will hopefully be done here in the next couple of months. So that'll be good. I learned something new that you have to get permission from the county to tear down your own building. Yeah, it, inside even non structural, <laughs> even non non structural uh, items. There's a you know that that not a false wall, but just a, a regular just a wall, not a non load bearing wall that's in there. Uh, demising wall between the loading dock and the space, and we, they can't just tear it down because we're going to open up. Uh, they still have to get a permit to tear it down, even though there's no structural changes. There's no, you know, there's no like major changes. They still had to wait to get a permit to demo it. So yeah, that that really blew my mind yeah. when I heard that, and it made me shake my head. Yeah, go back and 
think about something else so yeah. I didn't have to think about all the <laughs> weird permits we have to get for, for things we do yeah, on a regular basis. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's, uh, let's start with, um, our backgrounds here. So, um, Chad, you're a three gunner. Yep. Steven, you're a new three gunner. Yes. Or perspective you, three gunner. Perspective three gunner. Perspective three gunner. Up and comer. <laughs> still, still haven't decided yet. No, nah, it's, uh, it's exciting. Definitely want to get more into it as much as I can. Cool. Well, so Steven, let's, uh, let's talk about you then. When did you first uh, start getting into like practical shooting? Uh, years ago. I mean, back when I worked my retail days, um, we had this IDPA kind of chain wide uh, matches that we would do with, you know, four or five guys from every store. We'd get together and have our, our own little competitions. It's called uh, Turner's Top Shot, and it's way cooler than it sounds. <laughs> Um, well, you showed me like a, a YouTube video that they produced from it, and it actually looked like a lot of fun. Well, yeah. that was, and that was a three-gun match. Well, I mean, that video exists just for B-roll to play in the shops. So, obviously, you watch five minutes of it. You've watched the rest of the 50, you know. Um, but that's essentially the whole point of it. It's not so much to see who's the best shooter, but to have tons of, um, you know, material to play and get the salespeople more confident about what they sell and um, – you know, just get people out there to, you know, demonstrate what they sell, which is kind of the whole point. But it's a um, pretty cool concept. Yeah, it's it's different. You know, in California, you get ten round magazines, so there's a, a whole yeah. lot more reloading than than in uh, <laughs> the governor's match, for instance. <laughs> nice. And so, uh, so Stephen, what do you do here at Stag Arms? I am a sales rep. Where so at? I work the Northeast Territory, the uh, New York side, if you will. Mm-hmm. And um, been doing that for about a year now. Nice. Something like that. So if you're if you work at a dealer in the Northeast, Stevens your man. Yes. You need some yes. stagger arm stuff. I'm your guy. Nice. All right. So you started um in the Turner Top Shot and how many uh major matches had you gone to before the governor's match? Zero. So this is your first major match experience. Yes. Yes. All right, we're gonna get into th- what your thought about that one. First we're gonna find out who Chad is. <laughs> hey Chad. <laughs> Hello. So Chad, uh so you've done you've shot a lot of matches. Yeah. And you've been three going for a number of years now. Yep. Um mostly northeast. Northwest. Northwest. Yep. Excuse me, northwest. Yep. Yeah, I got my start. Uh first first match I shot was up in uh, Custer, Washington at the uh the TAC matches we used to have. Uh I got started doing like uh classes and stuff, the Magpole Dynamics classes back way back when they first started like 2009 and then 2011 and then we we stayed after the 2011 custer magpul class uh for the saturday which is a saturday match the tack match and i got to shoot that and that was uh, that was a lot of fun after that i was i was hooked and tried to shoot you know as many matches as i could um being from uh, western washington we had quite a few matches you could basically travel to at least one or two matches every weekend depending on how far you want to drive in the state so and were, were they all like three gun matches or they custom was, was two gun matches and then it ended up expanding into three gun matches and then um, one of the other clubs uh, marysville uh, had multi-gun matches um, so we did those and then uh, we drive over to afreda in eastern washington and shoot there and then uh, i got started with a bunch of friends of mine that would shoot those matches and then they would all go down to uh, bend oregon to shoot in the uh, uh, northwest uh, multi-gun uh, challenge so that was like the the big the first major match that i did and at that time, I was just, I was actually working as a defense contractor. I wasn't in the firearms industry. Uh, I was working for a defense contractor on uh, Fort Lewis. And then I uh, met all them, started hanging out with them. And then I ended up getting the position at Aero, position, Aero Precision. And then now uh, we went to, uh, so being part of that company, I decided we needed a presence and shooting three gun and stuff. So uh, we started sponsoring matches. And then the 2014. Uh, Northwest Multigun uh, Challenge was the first one that I went to, the first major match that I went to. And my buddies that I all went to there, they all RO'd the match. So they take a full week off, uh, drive down there, shoot the RO match the first two days, and then work the match the Friday, Saturday, Sunday of the actual match, and then drive back on the Monday. So um, the first time I went down there, I didn't shoot with them. I shot the, the regular weekend match. Uh, and it was a lot of fun, but I wanted to uh, do some more stuff too. So I think the next year we ended up setting up a, a demo bay. So I went there, shot the match with them uh, on the Wednesday, Thursday, and then worked the, the demo bay Friday, Saturday, Sunday kind of a thing, and then went back with them on Monday. And uh, it was a lot of fun. So Northwest Multigun was my first major match. 
Uh, and it was kind of an eye-opening experience, um, you know, being in the industry, but not necessarily traveling to some of the big matches. I knew a lot of people's names and faces from Facebook and everything. Mm-hmm. And then they were there, you know, what yeah. I mean? like they were there at that match because it was a, uh, it was a big deal. That was one of the, the biggest matches basically on, in the Pacific Northwest, if not the West coast. So, um, it was, he was huge, you know, Scott and Doug did a really good job at, uh, bringing in a lot of like prizes and stuff like the first 20 top 20 people got to take home a rifle, you know, wow. what I mean? which was huge. Like they had huge. piles of rifles. Uh, so like that was really, really cool. So I was really excited to try that out and try my hand at it. And the, the first, the first, the first year I shot it did not do very well at all. Yeah. Uh, I didn't prep as much as I should have. I didn't know my dope uh, as much. Uh, that match is pretty cool because every single stage you shoot all three guns and every single stage has at least one uh, 400 to 500 yard target. On oh, wow. It. So, if you don't know your dope, <laughs> you can be day. in trouble. Yeah, and I'm used to our, our regular attack matches, which are you know out to 100 yards. But most of them are close running gun hose hose fests for the most part, but some some accuracy stuff, but nothing further than 100 yards because they didn't necessarily have that. Mm-hmm. So that match was really eye opening. We got to do a lot of fun stuff um, and and learn a lot, but uh, it was really eye opening, uh, but a lot of fun and made me want to do some more. So. Tried to do more and more uh, when we were with Arrow. Uh, we did Superstition uh, Mountain Misty 3-Gun. That was uh, a lot of fun, too. That's one of the oldest 3-Gun matches, yeah. you know what I mean, in the country. And uh, they do a really good job at that. That range is pretty cool. Uh, we shot the uh, High Desert 3-Gun match out there in Parma, Idaho, uh, last year. That was a lot of fun, too. Um, so I missed it this year, but uh, hopefully next year uh, we'll be able to go hit that one out there. But Yeah, but this year's gotten kind of screwy because of the, uh, <laughs> the pandemic. And travel restrictions and stuff like that. Travel it's been restrictions, weird. some matches being closed or canceled, and others having the you know distancing restrictions and whatever else. Like it's just been, it has been a weird year for sure for matches. Yeah, so. and now they're getting all bunched up into September and October. So yeah. by the way, I'm yeah. not going to be around much September, <laughs> October. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, so Chad, what do you do here at, at Stag Arms? I'm the president of Stag Arms. Okay, so yep, I so, took over the uh, end of last year. Uh, when they wanted to um, try to do some changes. They'd already planned on moving. Uh, we announced the the change and the move out to here in Wyoming uh, from Connecticut and then uh, announced me uh, taking over as president of the company and, um, you know, changing leadership and direction and, and work on, you know, fixing a lot of things that uh, we thought needed to be needed to be corrected with stag arms. So Good, good. Uh, and for those of you at home wondering, yes, it is great to have a boss who's a, a three-gunner and understands. It's perfect. So um, the the first match, Chad, that we shot together was uh, Micah's Memorial mm, match. Yep. It was a one-day team match, and there was, uh, uh, it was a three-man team. We brought our compliance guy, Kyle, uh, down to Nunn, uh, Colorado. And, Stephen, you came with us, and yep. we're a photo guy. We mm-hmm. got some good photos from that match. Thank you. Okay. And uh, so that's where we, like, kind of, I guess, cut our teeth or tried to fill – I don't know – you know, you like you, you get new people on a squad. You try to fill each other out. It's like, yeah, how, how you got to know what do. What's your stage planning like? What their routine is for for prepping and for walking. And, how much and of a risk taker are, are you in your yeah. stage plans and that yeah. kind of stuff? Yeah. yeah. So, and then uh, um, Wyoming Governor's match last weekend. And so Chad, we actually turned it into a little bit longer trip. Left early, took some uh, lifestyle photography in some of the really cool um, places that Wyoming has to offer. Uh, sort of getting that outdoor feel and the uh, the Wyoming feel to a lot of our um, a lot of our social media uh, main site on the on the uh, homepage and stuff like that. So that part was really cool. We got to do some uh, uh, really good photography in the canyon right before. What is it? Is it uh, Wind? Was Wind River Canyon? Wind River Canyon. Thank yeah, you. right next to Wind River Reservation. Yep, absolutely incredible canyon. Yep. And we stopped to take the the worst time lapse. <laughs> yeah. So Stephen, I don't know if we told you this one. I'll have to show this or I'll have to show this one for the people uh, of the three gun uh, show audience. But um, <clears throat> we we stopped and we took a, a time lapse. So Chad and I are basically like killing time while one of our rifles sits next to the river and the camera's aimed at it, right? And so there's this big bird that flies by, and Chad's like, I wonder if if the camera got that. And then the, all of a sudden the rifle just goes thump. And falls right over. Awesome. Yeah. After, after it had been sitting for like, what, 10 minutes or something it was, like that? It was or, 22 minutes. Without oh, Jesus, yeah. yeah. Fail. Yeah, it was 22 minutes already. So then it's, 
And like a time lapse, the more time you spend out there, the better it looks, right? So now you're at that point of like, well, do we just stick around here for an hour on the side of the road? Yeah, do we re redo this and yeah, try and get back that 22 minutes or do we just bag it and try, you know, forget it? But of course, you're not going to be able to prop the rifle back up and edit that part out. No, nope, yeah, no. you got to start hard all to over cut. again. Yeah. Take, yeah. You know yep. what I mean? So, yeah, and then you yeah. try to figure out like where was it sitting in the grass and stuff. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the second time, Chad stuck his knife in the uh, in the ground and propped <laughs> it up like a tripod in the back. That's our president. Yeah, yeah I did right. just to make sure charge. it would stay. But then we didn't know because it was like, I don't even know what knocked it over. It wasn't like windy or anything. It just fell for whatever just reason after 22 time. minutes. You Tremors. know what I mean? So Butterfly flapped its wings. Something. Yep. But uh, no, it was good. Uh, it was awesome. We really wanted to take that big loop around Wyoming. You know, the, the move here is kind of a big deal for Stag Arms. Actually, it's a really big deal for Stag Arms. And yeah. We kind of wanted to get a feel for that, not only for the company, but for ourselves as well to kind of see what Wyoming has to offer. So, and we basically drove across, you know, from the southeast corner up to the northwest corner of the state yep. and did a big loop, um, you know what I mean, to take some pictures and stuff. So it was really good. Uh, I think we got some really good content out of that and then got to see a lot of the state and then, you know, got to go check out the match and stuff. And that was, that was a lot of fun too. So, yeah. So I was really excited about this match just because um, everyone, here in Wyoming that I've come in contact with that in, you know, as a representative of Stag Arms has been so super friendly to us and they're really welcoming. Wyoming loves having us, which is fantastic from me coming from Colorado. So I always felt like we should kind of make it a big deal when we go to the, the Wyoming governor's match. So it was great to bring the three of us. Our compliance guy, Kyle, came as well for support for an, another event that we're going to be talking about in a minute here. But uh, but overall, I th I thought it was a a great trip, and we're here to tell you about it. But first, Stephen, me, yeah. No. What, you, no. what was your first impression when we got to the uh, when we got to the range and we started walking stages? Uh, well, hands down, the most substantial range I've ever been to. Really? I mean, this place was not only huge, but had not just a little thing for everybody, but a lot for everybody, um, and it was just gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't just a gravel pit and some berms, you know, like most of the ranges you see. It's, it's yeah. Like, there's actually wildlife. They've got, like, an amazing view there. Yeah. Yeah, it was really cool. And it, it was cool that you had the, the natural terrain, which was really just awesome looking, but that was incorporated into the, some of the stages. So it wasn't just flat sand mm -hmm. you're you're crawling around on, but, but actual, like, rock formations and little valleys and just cool different you know, settings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was one stage where we got to shoot from a casket, uh, like a double kneeling position all the way at the bottom of this hill up to the top of the hill. And I thought that was one of the cooler shots because it was like a really steep angle. It wasn't like an unachievable, uh, unachievably far shot, but it was, uh, it was definitely unique. It's not something that you get to do that often. I definitely felt like that was the perfect place for a casket because <laughs> <laughs> doing that shot up, hill standing like not rested would have been really difficult yeah uh but from a kneeling position it was doable it wasn't um, too bad yeah it was definitely well placed mm -hmm. um and then a good like mixture of just rapid target acquisition with pistol coming off of a of a rested position on the casket it was cool dynamic yeah for sure yeah and then, then it's a, a good, good example of like what you would expect at like pete matches mm -hmm. pete renzing is the match director but it's uh, slow, fast, slow, fast, or fast, slow, fast, slow. Definitely. Like he likes to make you slam on the brakes and then slam on the gas and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. a lot of options in between. Yeah, he also likes to do right, left, right, left. And if you're not paying attention, yeah. you miss stuff. Did yeah. you miss anything, Steven? I'm sure I did. <laughs> I w didn't admit it at the time, but yeah, definitely. <laughs> there's always, you got to, wherever there's a barrel, just assume there's some target behind it. Yep. You can only see for a split second. Oh, and I so I told you that at the start too. Remember yep, that? Yep. I told you that too, Chad. Like because yep. the last year there was a uh, a target that I completely missed when in our walkthrough, and I I thought like, why are people stopping over there? You can eliminate this position if you just come over here. And then sure shit, there was like one small little six inch hex target back there. Yep. Yep. You wouldn't have known it either unless you were right there. So it's yeah. Like, Got to walk the stages. Yeah, and so. With with Pete's matches, I think it's definitely so. There's this old um, like rule of thumb, like get out of the shooting area and go walk around and touch every target and like make sure that you know where every target is, but not from the shooting area because they they try to get hidden. So look from the back of the stage, and this is one of those matches where I definitely think that helps. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, I like to do that too. Like if you walk through the stage, like you got your plan, but then when you get to the end, walk around it too. You know what I mean? Walk backwards yep. through it just to kind of see, just in case you miss something. Because sometimes you'll you'll miss it. You won't see it. You know what I mean? Walking through it because sometimes they they design it like that so that they are targets you don't necessarily see and then you walk backwards and you're like oh there was actually three paper targets back there not just the two i saw oh, yeah. so like okay i need to make sure i, I remember that so i actually did that on our, our third stage i didn't look to the right and i immediately looked to the left and shot the the two plates that were on the hill running past the the two plates that were behind the behind a banner mm-hmm. and uh had to come running back and shout at the ro move yep <laughs> did it safely though he was fast <laughs> yeah, they worked out. Him. Chad, did you miss any targets? I missed two. <laughs> I missed two targets again. Steel the steel plates. You start uh, shot the rifle, fine. Uh, dumped the rifle, went to shoot pistol, and then just uh, completely spaced about the two steel targets off to the left because I was focused on the targets on the right because I could only get. I missed one of those targets with the rifle, so I was planning it with a pistol on the way up, and then uh, just completely space that there were two steel plates so you know we're then left when you start yeah <laughs> ran past them shot all the all the stuff i was supposed to with the pistol except for those two and then i walked back and i was like oh you gotta be kidding me <laughs> and those are always the worst right because it's like it's not like it's paper you think you shot or you didn't shoot it there's steel targets that are still sitting up there you're like right. oh well and you were the first shooter on the stage so they were freshly painted yeah exactly it's like <laughs> they're still up it's like oh yeah yeah i'm like you know what i knew that those were there and i still forgot it anyway so yeah my my so that was stage five. That was yep. the first one we started on. My problem with that stage was uh, the four lie down targets at the back. Mm-hmm. Pete does this thing where he um, puts between two shoot targets. He puts a, puts a no shoot. That's probably like an inch and a half yeah. of a presentation, it's a border, right? yeah. just enough to screw Dave's weekend up. <laughs> <laughs> and I plugged. Uh, I I had such a great group on it too. I plugged one of those no shoot targets. Just thap thap. It was like, damn it, like the. It's like yep. an inch from each other. Both of them are on that paper. Did not get the shoot through. And then, uh, of course, on the the next one over, I plugged one there too. So very first stage took 15 seconds in penalties. Yep, right off the bat. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, those those no shoots were like magnets, just yeah. absorbing all my rounds. Yep. Yeah, they're yeah. just small enough you think, ah, you know, I don't have to worry about that. It'll be fine. Yeah, mm-hmm. but exactly. But no, you do. Mm-hmm. And it, a lot of people had uh, problems with that. I yeah. don't know if you guys uh, heard this or not, but uh, Keith Garcia was the only one to shoot a penalty-free match. I saw that, yeah. 250 Ooh. people in the match. Yeah. That's insane. Yep. Yeah, so even one of the other guys. Did he win? Yeah. He did not. Oh, okay. But <laughs> that is the key to winning, though, is typically is... Not sucking. This is not well. Not getting penalties too. The more penalties you get, the less likely you are to win. To win, so yeah, no doubt that is a, an important thing. But and also not forgetting targets that helps too. That too. But again, <laughs> that's a penalty. <laughs> so, uh, Stephen, how far had you shot in a match before this match? How far? Yeah. Like distance wise? Yeah. Like in a match? Um, usually not more than two hundred, but I'm sure more. there's a couple of times where it was like three fifty four, but rarely. So usually two hundred. Like Chad was talking about, like typically in Colorado, we would shoot out to like 200 yards. Mm. So when I, when I shot my first major outside of Colorado, and we're shooting like 450 yard targets, like holy crap, like this is hard. And then <laughs> I shot my first club match in uh, in Texas over a Dissident Arms uh, three gun that was in uh, Navasota, Texas. And uh, I remember my friend Mike giving this the state or match brief for everyone. He's like. All right, everybody, you know, we don't have a whole lot of time this weekend, so we're going to keep it tight. We're only shooting to 430 yards. And I thought, like, only shooting to 430 <laughs> yards. Like, holy cow, I've never seen this in a club match before. So in, uh, in, in preparation for this match, we, uh, we did take you to the range out of here, Auto Road shooting range. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got your, your dope with your, um, your 5.56 Federal, right? Something like that. Yeah. Federal 556. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, you had to pick up more for the match, and it was 223 Federal. Is that right? Mistake. Yeah. yeah. So not it's not a mistake if it's the only stuff you can get. Literally the only stuff I yeah, can get. Yeah, literally the only thing you can get. So, you know, we're in the middle of a, a pandemic. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but things are weird. <laughs> Components are hard to get. Ammunition's hard to get. So Stephen got whatever he could, and so he was mixing 55 grain, 223, 50, 55 grain, 556. And so we had targets that were like, th- uh, I think we had like three of them that were 369 yards, um, a bunch of them that were between like 110 and 207 yards, and then we had like one 425-yard target. 
Yeah, I mean, the idea was anything past 100 yards, use my precious 5.56. Five, <laughs> um, there was all, most, I would say most of the stages are under 100 yards. Maybe you get a couple, you know, that are past that. But yep. quantity-wise, I think just use the burner. I think there was, so there's 11 stages, I think, eight of them were under 207 yards. Yeah. And there was only three stages that were farther than that. Yeah. It's not like the 223 won't get out there. It's just my my dope's off, you know. Yeah. Really, I'm working with the slower it's round. A little bit slower, you know. Right. But it, I'd say it worked out okay, as long as I didn't get my 556 five, and 223 mixed worked, up. It worked out okay. I mean, it worked out great for you. Like, you hit every target. Well, luckily, I was I was focusing on when – we, we when we were sighting in, we, were, we spent a, most of our time out there on the 400. Mm-hmm. Because um, that's where I felt I was the least confident at, but it turns out. Well, and the reason for that is, is uh, you know, I looked at the information that Pete put out before the match, and he said that there would only be a handful of targets between mm. 350 and 400. So, so his idea of handful is a little different than ours. Five? I think there was five. Uh, I guess that counts. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, there was five. I feel like there was a lot of, like, two and 300 stuff, though, wasn't there? No, they, they were much closer than that. Oh. Most of them were under 207 yards. Okay. And there was five that were over, I believe, if my if my notebook from the match is still correct. Yeah. But that was three stages. I think that was stage 10, stage 11, and I forgot what other stage it was. Yeah. But I'm giving you kudos, man. You got Thanks, them all. Buddy. I was I was happily surprised with my rifle shooting skills. Um, with a rifle of you know, not terribly familiar with, at least that specific one. Obviously, I'm familiar with the platform, but that was my first time running that gun with your scope. Uh, yep. So it was it was a pleasant surprise. My pistol work, yeah, shotgun was atrocious, but, <laughs> you know, stuff to learn. Yeah, well, I thought you did great, man. Thanks, bud. Especially for your uh, your first big match. Um, what, what I thought was cool was, uh, you know, you asked for – uh, for help on stuff, and uh, my pal Forrest and I, who were were there, that um, he was on our squad. Great guy. Yeah, good dude. Took a lot of our guns home for us, which was awesome. Yeah, uh, really helped us out. But he uh, he re- remarked too. He's like he's like Stephen's probably the first person that has asked for advice and then done exactly what I told him to do. And so we both remarked on that. So I'm giving you like the VIP for the match. <laughs> they, because I'll take it. The pe- people ask for advice all the time, and they never, ever they listen never to it. They never follow like, ah, it, yep. I think I'm going to try this my way. Like, okay, my 10 years' experience doing this has nothing like, to do. Like, why even ask us about <laughs> <Yeah>. it? We're <laughs> just going to throw it away. <laughs> Pretty much. No, that's how I learn. And, you know, lips shut, ears open. But, um, yeah, I appreciate all the help. And yeah, well done. For us to definitely look forward to the next match we, we go to. Heck, yeah. Got to come soon. Yeah. We'll get a calendar. Um, so while while Stephen and I were shooting, Chad, you got to participate in a, a really cool thing f- uh, with the, uh, I guess, the NSSF's legislative outreach. So our buddy Nephi Cole, who works for the NSSF, um, reached out to us several months ago and said, hey, there's going to be a, a contingent of legislators from states surrounding Wyoming and they're going to be doing a team match. Can you bring out some guns for them? We thought, of course we can. We know yeah. a guy. So, yeah, exactly. That was great. <laughs> that was cool. So we got to bring out um, our uh, three-gun elite rifles mm-hmm. and um, our uh, PXCs yep. uh, because it's much easier to shoot, teach a, a novice to shoot a PCC than it is to have them shoot a pistol. Yeah. <laughs> Makes them feel like John Yes, Lick. much safer too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Much safer, the, yep. easier to control. So uh, we, um, you know, the the match is, is sponsored, you know, title sponsors Magpul presented by Vortex Optics. So we uh, got with our buddies at Vortex. And uh, Ruben lent us optics for all of our rifles. And Federal came in with ammunition for all the rifles. Yep. And uh, um, the legislators got to shoot, what was it, two stages? Yeah, they got to shoot two stages. And they broke them apart in teams of three. Is that right? And then they had like a Yeah, they, they broke up the, st- yeah, exactly. They broke up the, the state. So they had state. The uh, legislator that was shooting the pistol, state legislator was shooting the rifle, and the state legislator that was shooting the shotgun. Okay. Because uh, it was Benelli, I think, was the, the shotgun yeah, sponsor yep. as well. Benelli was um, up so there. So they were helping, there helping run Dying through. Ryan. So, yeah, they got to shoot. They modified the stage. Nephi uh, went ahead and modified the stage a little bit so they could get them through 
safely and quickly too. We don't have to spend too much time on the range. Just kind of wanted to get them, uh, you know, familiar, get a, a taste of, of what a match actually is, what you got to shoot. So they got to shoot a mix of close in targets and then far targets as well uh, with the rifle. And then, um, so they didn't do like a normal match where you, it's one guy running in there and dumping guns out. It was the one guy would run, uh, run his, you know, run the rifle and then they would stop him. And the next guy would then go up and shoot the shotgun. And then for pistols, then they ran the, the P, PXCs because um, it's just a lot safer. You know what I mean? You got a 16 inch rifle, with the stock, you can get more hands on it, more control on it, a lot mm -hmm. less recoil with, you know, 9 mil ammo. So they could still kind of get the idea. And they, they absolutely love the PXCs. I mean, it makes you, like you said before, uh, you know, when we're talking, it makes you feel like John Wick. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you're just running and gunning because there's not hardly any recoil at all. You know what I mean? You can shoot fast. And especially with the, you know, close in targets for pistol targets with the rifle, man, you can just, just hose them down. So they make they, big holes. Yeah. Yeah, shoot, you can see the steel. holes too. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, when you're shooting five by six at the paper targets, it's a little ways away. Sometimes it's hard to see the holes, but if you're shooting at least nine mil, you can see the holes pretty quick. So yeah. they got to shoot the the three gun elites. They shot a, the first stage. They shot a couple of close in paper targets that were, you know what I mean, a yard away kind of a thing. And then they go over to a wooden barricade system where they got to then shoot uh, four different uh, steel targets that were anywhere from I want to say it was like 150 to 200 yards. Uh, out and then they pull off that and then they shoot more paper targets on the way up to the shotgun stage so uh it really again goes to your your thing about how pete does slow fast slow kind of a thing so yep. fast slow fast so those were fast slow and then fast again and then and then dump the rifle so uh, they all had a really good time um they had some issues with the long range targets um and that was sort of our Part of our issue, too, when you're shooting some demo guns and you don't necessarily have access to the scopes or the ammo in ahead of time, so we, we had to do some hasty uh, zeroing of the rifles uh, with that particular ammo at the match to make sure that they'd have it, and we didn't have access to a, a longer range um, a longer range bay to actually make sure that they're on. You yeah, because I mean? there's that a distance. match going on. Yeah, there's a match going on, you know. So um, Kyle did uh, was able to... Uh, Improvise, adapt, and overcome. <laughs> Found a different range where at least they had uh, 25 yards and got it roughly zeroed. So the paper targets closer than they were fine. The first stage, they tried to hit the long range steel and they they weren't. And the uh, the lieutenant governor of South Dakota came up to me afterwards and he was like, you know, he's like, I shoot prairie dogs all the time. He's like, I held dead on all those targets. He's like, I should have hit them. And I said, sir, I believe you could have because you probably should have. So um, while they were then shooting the PXCs, I ran over to the next stage real quick. And zeroed it on those 200-yard targets because there were three, three 200-yard uh, steel plates uh, that they had to hit from that coffin because that was stage five that they were shooting. Mm. Um, so I zeroed them real quick to that, and the uh, the um, windage was good. But the elevation was off. I had to drop them down quite a few clicks, but made sure all those rifles were dead on. And then um, after they got done shooting stage four, uh, we went over to stage five, and they got to shoot the rifles and stuff, and they were all hubbub being a little bit about the rifles because there's more long range targets. <laughs> um, and then they, they got up there and the first guy went to go shoot and he went one for one on the long range steel. And I was like, yes, <laughs> like we did it. That's perfect. And then they all went through and everybody on the rifles, all those state legislators on the rifles, on the long range targets on that second stage hit the steel. So no kidding. All the steel. So that that's was, great. It was awesome. So they all, all knew what they were doing or at least could listen to instruction. Cause there were a couple guys that hadn't really shot before, but they listened to instruction and were able to, you know, still hit the targets and stuff. And I, that was great. I mean, to, to see those state legislatures out there, like these are not people from, from my home state of Washington. Like you won't see that very often. We've yeah. seen that a few times uh, here and there when we got a few things, um, you know, pushed through in, in Washington state with suppressors and short belt rifles and stuff. You'll get a few state legislators on some demo day stuff, but like this is actually a match, mm -hmm. like an actual match, like the run and gun, you know, match thing. So to have the state legislatures out there was awesome. And to have that many of them from, different states out there it was yeah. south dakota um it was wyoming it was colorado it was utah and it was i think there was one more was there was it montana i think montana or idaho or one of those oh, idaho. Was out there. they were out there and uh yeah it was just it was amazing to have them have them out there and, and participating and they were excited you know what i mean they were having fun uh one of the guys from utah um he, he did not was not very familiar with rifles didn't have a lot of experience but um, he got up after hitting those long range steel targets on stage five and he just had a smile on his face because like, it was an awesome feeling because you, they're flashers, you shoot it, you see it swing, you know, you hit it. And then yeah. to have the RO behind you, like watching, ding. calling a hit, you know, I mean, when you hit it, like that's just a, a really good feeling. So it was really awesome to see that. It was really, really amazing that the NSSF was able to put that on and that those state legislatures are, are willing to 
uh, come out there and see, you know what I mean, what the industry does. Yeah. So. I think that's really cool, too. And, um, you know, Governor, uh, the governor's name is on the match, right? So mm-hmm. Governor Gordon was out there, yep. which is fantastic. Uh, he's a Wyoming uh, governor. Um, and one of the things that you and I uh, were talking about on the way back was um, not only that they came out and shot them, because we've seen, you know, legislators shoot like a demo or something, something in just a few yeah. rounds. But this was a match. And then – there was 200 people with guns on their hip yeah. walking around yeah. and there wasn't like a whole lot of, you know, weird secret service or yeah. no one gave us a hard time for, for just doing what we normally do. And as a matter of fact, like uh, Steven and I, were, uh, actually you were there too over on uh, stage nine and it was our last stage of the day. I just happened to see a guy that was wa- uh, watching us and I do what I usually do and just walk up and say, Hey, you know, I'm Dave. Do you have any questions about what we're doing and anything I can explain to you? And uh, then turned out it was the, the lieutenant governor of South Dakota, and yeah. he was looking for Governor Gordon. I'm like, oh, there he is over there. So, yeah, which it's not, it's not an ordinary occurrence where I'm from to be sitting there with a 2011 on your hip and shaking hands with the lieutenant governor of another re- state. Yeah, so that yeah, was... without security, security freaking out or something, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was just awesome. It was uh, it was a really good environment. It was really good too to see like uh, was it Wyoming Parks? I uh, was out there too yep. with the, with the booth, and then um, they had the volunteers too that were out there helping. Yep, uh, with the the different uh, squads and stuff to help uh, scorekeeping and stuff like that. So yeah, Pete does scorekeeping um, different, and I think it's a really interesting concept. And I like it a lot because you get to know your scorekeeper over the weekend. Mm-hmm. But we you basically have like a scorekeeper that travels with with the squad. E- yeah, with each squad. Yeah. And several of those um, scorekeepers were from Wyoming Parks, mm-hmm. which is really cool to uh, to be able to talk to people from different parts of the state and talk to them about what environment they work in and what their concerns are and things like that. It's because this is a, a really big, diverse state. Yeah. And there's a there's a lot of terrain around here, so it's yep. it's cool to talk to people from other parts of the state. Yeah, and it was just cool to see the state, you know, back- backing it too with, yeah. with employees. I mean, like that's a that was a big deal. I've never been to a match before that's had that, and that was yeah. a really cool, really refreshing thing to uh, to see. So, as I as I've said, like this match, the Wyoming Governor's match, I think is one of the most. It's probably the most important match in the mm-hmm. country because it is backed by a state government, and it has the the buy in of all the the decision makers of that state. You know, and it, it shows not only are they friendly to firearms, but they're willing to come out and like represent as well. It's, it's yeah. not just like, we'll allow you to have your firearms. Yeah. They're, they're publicly friendly. For yes. Sports, exactly. Firearms yeah. and second amendment and shooting sports, you know what I mean? Which it's means a, a lot, yeah. right? Cause for a long time, it's been verboten to hang with people like us. Yeah. The <laughs> mostly they, they just allow it. They just don't, yeah. they don't say yes or no. They just don't say anything. You know yeah, what I mean? Uh, they just don't acknowledge it. Yeah. It's like a redhead stepchild kind of thing. Yeah, they just don't – yeah, they don't acknowledge it. They don't say yes, they don't say no. They just don't acknowledge it, you know what I mean, as, mm-hmm. as a thing. But uh, I think it's a big deal. It's, uh, I mean, it's it's tourism for those cities, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you're talking about how many people that were in the match. There was like 250 competitors yep. in the match plus families and support personnel. So you figure there's at least 500 to 600 people then yep. that came in to that city for that, that full weekend, you know what I mean, to – yeah. Rent uh, hotels to buy food. You know what I mean to go out Dairy to eat. Queen, uh, eat Dairy Queen. Yeah, exactly. All so. kinds of good stuff. <laughs> so the the uh, the impact is great, right? Especially like yeah. uh, so. Wyoming relies a lot on tourism. Yeah. You know, there's a um, a lot of am- amazing things to see in Wyoming, and it is a state that that relies on tourism yeah. for a lot of reasons. But um, one of the the Sad things is because of COVID, the match was limited to like 250 people. I yeah. know people that wanted to get in the match and couldn't couldn't yeah. do it. So there could be an even greater economic impact. Yeah, yeah. If it was open, I mean, yeah, for sure. Well, and so speaking of if it was open, so you've got the Cody Firearms Museum that's mm-hmm. uh, there and uh, part of the was the Buffalo Bill Buffalo Bill uh, Museum of the West. There you go. Uh, was there? Yeah, that, yeah. that's the that, that's where the museum that's the is. complex, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. So. Um, Last year, they had, like, a reception there at the Cody Firearms Museum, and unfortunately, they couldn't ha- have it this year. So mm-hmm. we uh, somehow finagled a, uh, a tour of, of the Cody Firearms Museum. And uh, I got to see a lot more guns this year than I did last year because it was a lot – last year was, like, a lot of uh, hello and meeting people and stuff like that. So yeah. this was really cool. Had you guys been to the Firearms Museum before? Nope. 
Nope, no? I had not. It was the first time. Hmm. What would you think? It's amazing. Yeah? Yeah, it's – he had – Two things that I like, museums, like old cool stuff, but then also old cool guns. So it's like <laughs> two passions in one. Um, I really liked how they had everything formatted and organized. Yeah. It, all the displays seemed to tell a story that you can follow along with, even without someone explaining things to you. But yeah. we did, which was even better. Yeah, that was cool too. Uh, Danny did an awesome job of, you know. True professional. Yeah, and all from memory. I, I I admired how much passion he had for his job. Yeah. Like if if anyone could have that much love for their career, I mean, all the power to you. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. So, like you said, the the displays told a story, and then as you walked, like the story just got longer and longer. You know. Yeah. yeah. Through the the history of firearms up until, um, the, I guess you know the modern era, but they they took like a little uh, side branch for Western culture, yeah. which is a nod to Wyoming, which I thought was absolutely amazing. Um. I like, really well laid out. I like, too, how they split up the realistic Wild West and then also pop culture <laughs> Wild West, which obviously is very different. Right. Um, anachronistic at times, but still cool. Uh, the part that I liked the most, obviously, was, you know, the old flintlocks and stuff like that. But really, really what I liked was the, the military evolution of, like, military arms. Yeah. You know, going from, like, Civil War guns all the way up to World War II and Vietnam and beyond. It was That was the neatest part. You know, um, I think it was Kyle that pointed it out, um, our compliance guy. He used to work at the Cody Firearms Museum. Um, things that were made pre-war and were brought to war were, like, more ornate and beautiful. And then things that were made during the war or invented during the war and then produced during the war were, like, super functional. Yeah. Only the things that needed to be Especially there. Especially if you're losing the war. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Resources are tight, and you know you don't need it to look pretty or even work that good. You just yeah. need to make a lot of them. Yeah, it needs to function and function. Yeah, exactly. And and that's not something that I had ever paid attention to before until you said that. And so that really struck me as like, oh, there. Not only are we looking like, um, you know, different, different like um, eras, like the World War One era, the World War Two era, but there's eras within those eras of of different development as the war went on. I thought that was, like, really interesting. I find World War II the most interesting of all eras. Yeah, and for sure. I think that concept is prevalent in military arms throughout World War II the most. I mean, look at a Sten gun or, mm -hmm. like, some of the, the last-ditch Nazi, you know, stampings that, you know, normally you'd expect these first-world countries to only make gold. Like, everything they produce is going to be great, but some of it's just, like... Well, I guess that works. Yeah. <laughs> Does it throw it's, a projectile? It's hideous, but I'm sure it works. <laughs> yeah, well, that's pretty interesting. What what, uh, what did you like about the museum there, Chad? I liked everything about it. I liked that it was a mix of, of modern, but also like the historical stuff uh, too. And I think that it was it was pretty cool to to see all that and see some like the special guns, like Audie Murphy's guns, and there were Annie Oakley's gun that was yeah. in there, like. Stuff like that was pretty cool. They had, like, the old uh, Winchester repeating arm sign over one of the halls. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? From, like, one of the original Winchester factories. And I thought it was pretty cool. It was really well laid out. I mean, just didn't have enough time there. I mean, we got our, our own private tour after hours, but we were there for an hour and a half, two hours, and that was, like, maybe about half as much time as we needed. I yeah. probably needed another at least two hours because we didn't even get to go downstairs. But I just, I like the way that it laid out. They had the stories and stuff. They had some of the, the cutaways. And just to kind of see the history of, of firearms, and one of the things Kyle was talking about, too, uh, was about how back in that time frame, like 1800s, 1900s time frame, most of the firearms development wasn't necessarily about improving things. It was about getting around patents Yeah. Uh, that yep, people had totally. on things. So they would do things in a different way. They'd rotate a cylinder a different way, or they would you know, change the action slightly so that it was not infringing on someone else's patent, you know, for the firearms. And not, if you just looked at it, you'd say, okay, that's kind of cool. Maybe they're trying to learn how to do different things. But to hear actually Kyle say that this is why they were doing that is mm -hmm. to get around patents. Like, oh, like that's kind of eye-opening, you know, to see the... And to me, it, it also, it just really reinforces, uh, you know, the creativity of the firearms industry in general. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, the firearms industry has been always been around about... Um, doing things, thinking outside the box and doing things differently. You know, even during like assault weapons ban, we still had ARs, you know what I mean? Sure. They just did different configurations. And, and even nowadays with, uh, you know, the different states that, that ban firearms or ban specific configurations of firearms, the firearm industry is like, oh, you, 
do you think a flash hider is bad? Well, we'll put a muzzle brake on it instead. Yeah. You know I'm going to pin mean? that flash yeah. yeah. So it's just like the, the creativity in the firearms industry has been there for, you know what I mean, as far back as you, you probably want to look and see. Yeah. You know what I mean, as far back as it, it started. So Yeah, I mean, like with without context, if you looked at an AR pistol, you'd be like, why is – why <laughs> – why why <laughs> why you know but knowing that it's you know a pistol is yep. purchasable just straight over the counter yep. or sbr requires 200 dollars tax stamp yep. like oh that makes sense so like some someday chad yep. the other is going to be in a museum it should be it should be now like to me that's like the the greatest the greatest invention of the last probably what are five or ten years now i think it is that they first others you know, it came about, it was like 2015, right? 2014, 2015 time frame. So you always have to say other and do the quotes, bunny ears yes. quotes, but people can't hear that. So yes. do you want to tell people what an other is? Do you want to explain that? So an other firearm, another complete firearm is... And this um, is not an any other weapon. Everyone's correct. like, oh yeah, I know what that is. No, no, no. It's yeah, no. not an AOW. It's still, it's still just a Title One firearm, so it's still regular 4473 transfer. It needs to be at least 26 inches overall length. Uh, it is not subject to barrel length uh, requirements. So in the AR platform, uh, it needs to have at least like an 11 and a half inch barrel if it's got a uh, carbine uh, receiver extension on there. And then you add the vertical foregrip to it. So it's basically an AR pistol with a vertical foregrip on it. And when, as soon as you add that vertical foregrip, it magically changes the designation from being a pistol into being an other, as long as it's more than that 26 inches overall length requirement. So mm -hmm. if it's shorter than that, then it does become an AOW. But as long as it's at least 26 inches in length or longer, now it's an other. And an other is a Title One transfer, just like a, a lower receiver is. It's an other because it's, it's a different category of firearm that the ATF has made up uh, back in, I think it was 2015. So um, the, the fact that you can do that now and transfer it in some states, like in Connecticut, like in Washington State, and others not subject to state uh, restrictions because the state doesn't define it. So right. it defaults to federal definitions. And because of that, you can do a same-day transfer on it. Whereas Washington State just implemented a mandatory 10-day wait on any semi-automatic firearm, pistol, or rifle. You know what I mean? The other transfers same day. So Connecticut uh, has not allowed, um, you know, AR-15 since, since Sandy Hook, since 2013. But in other, because it doesn't have a definition for the state, is transferable within the state because it doesn't meet the definition yeah. of a pistol or a rifle. So I, I just, it's again, creativity of the firearms industry. So yeah, just putting parts together in a different configuration, like is, is a big deal. I think you're right too, actually. I mean, they could actually have a whole section on, on other, to me, that's actually Compliance. interesting. Uh, you know what I mean? The ATF, yeah, I don't know if people know this or not, but the, the ATF basically didn't want people, didn't want 18 year olds to purchase pistol grip only shotguns. So they changed the configuration of a pistol grip so only like shotgun. So, like the shockwaves, Mossberg shotwaves. Not, that's even before that. Oh, even before this, that? This was just the persuaders that just had oh, an 18, 18 inch barrel, but a pistol grip, pistol grip only on it. Huh. So they didn't like they didn't want eighteen to twenty year olds to be able to purchase that. So they changed the definition of a pistol grip only shotgun uh, to be an other from a shotgun because an other you have to be twenty one or older to purchase, whereas right. a shotgun or rifle is eighteen. So in doing that, they created this new new classification of firearm, and now you get to the point where you've got ARs that are in that, and now the shockwaves too, because uh, it's the same thing. A, a firearm is only subject to overall length restrictions. It's not subject to barrel length restrictions. So Things like shotguns, traditionally, where you had to have, you know, 18-inch barrels. Well, now you can get a 14-inch barrel because if you have the grip, the bird's head grip or a shockwave on there that extends the overall length more than 26 inches, you can have a short barrel on it now yeah. where you couldn't before. So um, I do think that would actually be a, a pretty cool display they could do it at Cody at some point is to kind of like the, you know what I mean, how things have changed over the years and about how, how laws Laws implemented have changed the way the firearms industry now manufactures and, and classifies firearms because for us, it's really just a different combination of parts. They already had the 14-inch barrel barrels for the shotguns. It was just only on short-barrel shotguns. Right. But now you can use the same part you already have, and you can sell it to anybody because now it's a Title I firearm. So. And by the way, the most Gucci gun that we sell is flying under the radar as the 12-and-a-half-inch Elite. Yep. 12-and-a-half-inch Elite Other. Yep. 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 It's got a, it's got a little bit of bling to it. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's got some of the nickel boron parts in there yep. and, and fancy things on there. But comes with, uh, comes with Magpul sights and twelve and a half inch barrel. And plus, it has like a uh, f um, like a VG six flash hider slash epsilon. Yeah, is it the epsilon? Yeah, yeah. 
Nickel Boron two stage trigger too. And, nice trigger. and the Nickel Boron nice. two stage yes. trigger again, yeah. low key the the Gucciest rifle we sell. I th- or, yeah. uh, and the best brace. Not, you know, not to the best around. what the best brace in, in my opinion. Oh, the SBA, SBA three. three. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I don't think you're going to get a lot of arguments on that one yeah, until further notice. I think that's the winner. <laughs> <laughs> that is the winner for sure. Remains to be seen for yeah. sure. Yeah, so huge thanks to uh, Danny and Kristen for uh, yeah. walking us through the museum after hours. We totally appreciate that. Yep. Uh, guys, at at any three-gun match, most of the match is taken up by giving your buddies a hard time. <laughs> Definitely. In between helping them out. So uh, a couple funny stories. Um I think you have one about slugs. Do you want to talk mm, about the slugs. type of slugs that you were using? Way too big. Um, so as so we again, about again, we kind of joined a little late. So you, I was like, and there's nine slugs in the ma- or 18 slugs in the match. And yeah, I you said gulp. Had to f- scramble to get <laughs> enough ammo just in general. But let alone, oh cool, now I need slugs too. Um, couldn't find anything in any sort of like quantity. So I get like five of this type or five of that type. <laughs> But I don't know the dope on those. Um, so I ended up having to buy like 10 boxes of three inch, uh, you know, slug, uh, what is it, like Remington Sluggers? Oh, nice. They're fast. and They're, they're actually pretty accurate, too. Well, that's what I liked about them. I thought yeah. that was just a compromise, but it, maybe next time I might use them again because even at like, what, 50 yards, those big silhouettes we did? Yep. It was dead hold. Like yep. it was easy. You don't need to be accurate if your projectile is going fast enough. Right, just laser beam. There you go. You don't need to, don't need to know your dope. <laughs> just hold it right on there and pull the trigger. Yeah, close your eyes. And um, you definitely don't have to wait for someone to call your hits either. Like, <laughs> you hear it. It pings with authority. <laughs> with authority. Yeah. yeah, that echoes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh. I learned on that uh, stage that my uh, uh, when my shotgun heats up, that I need to hold five o'clock apparently. Interesting for uh, for slugs. Yeah, huh. I I missed. Oh man, so that same stage. So w- what was that stage? One that was stage one, wasn't it? All the way at the end. I think there? So yeah. yeah, so that was stage one. So it was uh, two flyers, a bunch of birdshot uh, targets on the ground. You know, knock down steel, and then four slugs on the hill. Right. So I brought eight slugs with me, and I <laughs> I shot all eight of those slugs and still left one uh, target unhit, and then went through the the pistol run. And just felt like I was running through molasses and, like, couldn't see my front sight and everything. And I come up at the end, and there was two uh, six-inch hexes that were lying on the ground. And I just threw around over them. And the RO was like, were those already on the ground? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you got to reshoot. I'm like, thank God. And <laughs> well done. <laughs> Luckily, the uh, the reshoot gods were kind on this one, and I, I was able to get the, uh, uh, the slug targets uh, without any sort of – you know, having already practiced the stage, it was much easier, but <laughs> without any sort of fanfare, I got the slug targets on the second one. Can you imagine if everyone had a chance for a redo? Dude. You don't. <laughs> you don't, <laughs> don't want it. So, Anytime I've ever had a reshoot, it's not gone well. You think like, oh, I already shot it once. Like, I, I got a, I got a better plan yep. how to do this. And Spake then different mistakes. something else will yeah. happen, and it's just it never – it never goes well. That's why mm-hmm. I said the reshoot gods. And that's exactly what happened, too, is I was coming down the hill to go load up my caddies again because there was only, like, two shooters, and then I would have to go again. Chad's walking up, just coming from the legislator shoot, and I was like, oh, I got to reshoot. And he goes, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. <laughs> like, no, I don't think it can go any worse than it just did. So, luckily. Challenge accepted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah luckily I was able to uh, to pull that one out. Thank goodness. Also, I won a one dollar bet against Garrett Grover. Oh, yeah, I beat him by one spot. I think he beat me last year. I got him this year. Should have bet more. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. He's pretty good. Mm. We'll just frame that dollar then. Yeah, I will when I get it from him. <laughs> I gotta go to Oklahoma to get it from him. Oh, <laughs> it's gonna be a while. It's a bit of a travel. <laughs> yeah, worth it though. Chad, any good stories from the match? Any good war stories? Uh, well, I only got to shoot one stage, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sad. Yeah, so apparently practice is actually important. So we shot that, that first stage and did okay. Missed the targets. I'm like, all right, I'm you know knocking the rust off. It's the first match of the year for me. First match in the year for me. Yeah, it was me. first match of the other year for than me, too, the, other than the Mike Memorial, other than the Mike Memorial uh, one. You know what I mean? So I go to the shoot that 
shoot the next stage and I was sh I shot last because I was first on the first stage so which I hate by the way I hate being first on the first stage on the first day that's I know to me it's always just been bad luck I don't know if it's in my head or what yeah she uh, just bad luck Barb did his dirty on that one uh Alphabetical by first name. I, I gulped, and then I saw that Chad was first. I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we shot that. So we went over to shoot the second stage, and we'd done, you know, stage prep and stuff. So I, I knew what I needed to do. And um, we started off with a shotgun on that one, and I didn't shoot the shotgun at all on stage five. It was only pistol rifle. So yep. started off with a shotgun, and, uh, you know, I hadn't shot the shotgun in, in a year. You know what I mean? Hadn't cleaned it in at least a year. So I still had, yeah, you had, a, dust. You had a couple mouths from... I Mike did actually in a Mike Memorial match, match so yeah. You did the yeah, detail I just, clean. I just lubed it up uh, at, before that match, and I still had a couple of feeding issues, which typically it, it doesn't. It works pretty well. You know, Brown 85 does pretty good. So uh, I wanted to make sure I was more prepared this time, so I actually, you know, detail stripped it and cleaned everything out and lubed it all up. And uh, some of my cleaning stuff is still in Washington, so I kind of had to make do with what I had. And I went a little liberal with the lube uh, on, on some stuff, and I thought I cleaned most of it up, but it wasn't quite cleaned up all the way so shotgun was a little slippery and shot i shot the first two um poppers and then they um have the the toasters that come up and something happened and i was just like completely off my stage plan i don't even remember exactly what it was that happened that fast to throw me off and i'm just like something's not right you know what i mean so i go to load and then as i went to pick it up pull up the shotgun to my shoulder it started to slip and i naturally grabbed it because it was slipping of and fingers on the trigger, and it let off a round, you know what I mean, before I had it up to my shoulder, and I was just like, fuck. And then it jammed, too, yep. in the first place. Like, that shell didn't even come out, so I'm just like, like, it didn't feel right on the recoil impulse on that last one, and then when I went to load, like, it just, I don't know, something was off. I don't know if it was in my head or what, but it was just off, so uh, it happens, you know what I mean. It slipped out of my hand. I grabbed it, let off a round when I was supposed to, DQ. I'm like, yep, I know, it. I know, I get it, you know what I mean? So at least it was in the safe direction. We're shooting the same direction. We're shooting the pigeons and stuff, so it wasn't uh, a huge deal. At least it wasn't like a slug or something, yeah. you know what I mean? Well, and you, you hit the ground. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, it wasn't like a, a big deal. But I didn't have it on my shoulder. I had it in my hand, you know what I mean? So, um, so you know, DQ, stop. I'm like, yep, I know. I'm like, yep, I know. I'm done. Second stage of the match of a three-day match, and I'm done. <laughs> I'm like, that figures. And the thing is... I keep doing that. The last big match I shot was Parma <laughs> last year, a year ago. I did the same thing too. Not not the same thing. That one I had my that one I had my handgun fell off my uh, holster hanger uh, and uh, ended up uh, getting DQ'd because uh, they brought that with me and when I set it down, it spun around and it's loaded in the holster. And of course, oh, as soon as no. it spins around, it's like yeah. you know what I mean. But I'm shooting shotgun. I didn't notice it spinning around. So, anyways, it was. I tend to have issues like that sometimes. I've you know, DQ'd a Superstition Mountain before, too. Um, so it was kind of a, a thing. And I think a bunch of my, my friends uh, from Arrow had already posted about, you know what I mean, about just getting DQ'd or whatever. And sure enough, second stage, done. DQ'd. I'm just <laughs> like. So apparently practice is a thing. Actually, uh, you know, preparing with your equipment and making sure it's ready to go is a thing. So that was uh, that was a lot of fun. Humbling. But. Um, my girlfriend tells me this all the time. Everything happens for a reason. And I was lucky that I was DQ'd in the fact that we needed the help uh, for that legislator shoot. Yeah. So the legislators were shooting at the same time our um, squad was shooting. Mm -hmm. And Kyle was the only one there. And um, he would have been really struggling to try and run that by himself. Uh, yeah, run all those stuff mags, that, manage so. people, yep. shooting. Yeah, it's it's a lot of work for one person. Yep, so I'm glad. <laughs> and there's no way we would have been able to re-zero the rifles between the stages, too. You yep. know what I mean? Because he just there's no way that he could have done that. So um, sucks for me. Uh, humbling, obviously. The first, first Wyoming governor's match living in Wyoming and didn't even get it completed. So, um, but... It was it was good that that happened and then I got to work with the state legislature so I was uh, was pretty happy about that so yeah that was that was a good thing and uh, I think uh, next year so Nephi's already planned on doing that thing bigger better than next year mm, yep. and uh, I told him cool no problem you just got to put us on the same schedule so yep we're gonna make that happen yep it, uh, was, it was good I was a little bummed though because I shot that first one and I shoot limited so red dots so we we're shooting those steel plates. You know what I mean? Out there yeah. to 200 or wherever they were, I was like, I was stoked because I felt felt pretty good about, about my zero and about shooting that gun for the first time, you know what I mean, in a match. So I was really excited because that next next stage had 
uh, different uh, distance targets. Yep. You know what I and mean? those were so, offhand yeah. targets too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was really excited to get to shoot that, and then didn't get to shoot any more of the rifle. So, oh, well. <laughs> How many rifle rounds did you crank off then? So six, two, eight, <laughs> ten? No, I eight. shot all the paper oh, on you stage did? five okay. with that. So I actually oh, did so get shot like, enough. I shot like a full mag, basically. Oh, yeah, that's enough. So that was, that was some, you know what I mean? It was not quite enough. I mean, it wasn't as bad as the uh, – we had that other kid in our squad, too, oh, that yeah. DQ'd. Uh, he six shot, shots. Was it six or was it four? I guess there were three targets It was there, three right? targets. Yeah. It was whap, 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 Yeah, whap, so he shot, the, shoot the rifle. As soon as it started to move, his pistol came out of his holster and – DQ'd because it's loaded. So yep, yep. That's that's tough. Uh, what flavor Blizzard did you get? Uh, Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. <laughs> okay. Was it worth it? No, it's never worth it. <laughs> no, absolutely not. The funny thing was though. So of course I waited till after we we're done with the weekend because I knew I was going to get a whole bunch of crap for that. So waited till after we were done to go to DQ and get the picture and then post it and stuff. And then the funniest thing was people were commenting because I took the picture in front of DQ and they had the sign on there for these. Uh, DQ Blizzard Cakes, and people are like, there's DQ Blizzard Cakes? I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> that was the biggest takeaway. Is that, yeah, that was the biggest DQ's takeaway. That DQ Blizzard has cake. Blizzard Cakes. It's not that Chad DQ'd again. It's that DQ has Blizzard Cakes for sale. Well, so. next time we just DQ as a squad and we can get a cake. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well. uh, so we we got to shoot with the, uh, the Marine Combat Shooting Team. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was two uh, typical three gunners, and then I think they had – was it four other guys or five other guys? I can't remember. But uh, those are the um, the pistol team. I know, yeah, I noticed one of the guys was a pistol because they had he had a different shirt and it had pistol yep. on there with his name uh, on it. So I figured they probably grabbed some other discipline yes. shooters to. So what to it was shoot, is so. the uh, the the pistol series since it's typically indoors mm -hmm. it was largely canceled for the year. So oh, they yeah, had to huh? get those guys out to. To get, get, get some shoot. trigger time, yeah. Yeah, so uh, a couple of those guys beat me. I'm not real happy about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the pistol shooters who uh, don't know oh, yeah, shoot rifle and shotgun. Again, yeah. yeah, but uh, good for them. They're, yeah. uh, they're a bunch of great people to squad. That was with. awesome. They had uh, A lot of them had their family and stuff, too, mm -hmm. uh, come down there, so that was really cool to see. So yeah, That was really cool. Like, I didn't even know that was a thing. I don't, I don't even think it was much of a thing back when I was in college. You know what I mean? Like the Army, AMU, and the Marine Corps shooting team and stuff like that. So it's really cool to see you know, the armed forces uh, develop and, and have shooting teams like that because I do think it's really important for them, not only as like a recruiting tool, but just uh, to have us being out there as part of the, you know, the industry too. So Yeah, being a, being a part of the industry, there's the, uh, you know, testing new gear out, mm -hmm. you know, like red dots, like even low-power variable scopes, like you didn't see a lot of those until basically Afghanistan, right? Yeah. And uh, they probably would have been handy in some other wars. Oh, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of that technology is vetted through, uh, competitive shooting sports, which is really cool to uh, uh, to have that sort of thing, and then it trickles down through the the rest of the military. But all right, guys, so um, I give uh, we're getting kind of toward the uh, end of our uh, podcast here. Um, want to ask you first: um, Is there anything you want to um, want to do different next time, or big plans for next year? And then I'm going to give you um, each an opportunity for a final thought. So, Stephen, let's. Let's talk about you. We got your first Wyoming Governor's match under your belt. First big match living here in uh, in Wyoming, and uh, it was in Wyoming, which is awesome. Yeah. And we're going to shoot a bunch more. So what uh, what do you have for goals uh, going in for next year's match? Goals, definitely more trigger time with a shotgun, um, particularly slugs. I feel like I could be pretty good at that if I can, you know, do what I know with rifles and just do that with slugs. I mean, that would be – useful uh pistol i i always know i have to work more on that because it's such a perishable you know part of it um and definitely as chad put it watch your gear make sure it's ready to go i had uh trigger pins fall out on me like yeah. literally a second <laughs> before right. the buzzer I was like uh, uh help do you have any tape that's one of my funny stories from the match i forgot to tell was you had to borrow my uh rifle in the last two stages oh that yeah which is please please tell the story which wouldn't necessarily <laughs> be a big deal but there were four targets that were on the hills and I was like, well, do I let him use my rifle, my scope, different dope and his ammo through it? Or do I lend him this ammo that I had to buy this precision ammo I had to buy, which was like a federal 73 grain burger bullet stuff, dollar 36 around. I was like, all right, well, I'm probably going to be working with Stephen for a while here. So I'll just lend him <laughs> seven rounds. <laughs> was it six or seven? I gave you seven. I well, appreciate I, it. I told you there were six, but you had one more. Oh, thanks. Yeah, and we, we learned how to candy cane our D60. 
Yes, <laughs> yes. That worked out pretty well, though. It did work out well. I think really that well. was one of my better stages. Those, that that ammo is like the shit. I hate to say it because it's $1.36 a round, but it's pretty good. You get what you pay for, man. I know. So, um, um, As far as what I would take away, I mean, um, that match was humbling for sure. Like, what I liked about the match and what was freaking me out were the same things. That mm-hmm. you're, you're amongst really talented individuals, and I felt wildly outclassed by my peers, especially, like, just the guys we're staged with, um, the Marine Corps shooting team. Those were solid guys. Yeah. Um, you and Forrest were doing it for a long, a lot longer than me, so it was good to learn from everybody and take what I could from them, um, and I think next time I'll have a lot more confidence with it and a lot more trigger time, you know, to boot. Um, like, you and Chad, I mean, I just haven't done a whole lot of shooting in the last, you know, year and a half, so... Something to, to keep in mind and and make time for it. So next next year I can do you know much better. Absolutely, good goals, Chad. For you, uh, well I think goals for next year are pretty easy. I actually, finish the match. You finish so. the match. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you know I know I know the things I do wrong. I just gotta find the time to actually do them right. You know, not not practicing and not uh, going to shoot a major match <laughs> is not practice. You need to practice before you shoot the major match. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I knew that from doing doing other things too, but you got to actually put the put the practice time in to do things. I've gotten kind of well, just been busy. Well, busy. You know, last couple of years though, the only time I have to actually go to a match is some of these major matches. But uh, practice and shooting some local matches, you know, really helps out. Helps out a lot. Knock the rust off and make sure your gear is ready to go. And then, uh, you know, gear prep, making sure your your stuff's cleaned and ready to go. Uh, that that. Well, that gave me two issues already in the two matches I've shot this year. You know what I mean? Having the, the loading, some of the loading issues there at the Mike and Memorial match and then uh, DQing in this match. So, um, you know, knowing your gear and prepping your gear is, is important. I kind of went over that with Steve, too, uh, mm-hmm. a little bit, like, at that night. Like, uh, you know, what I was doing in major matches, when you get back that night, clean, lube, load mags, you know, and prep everything that you can for, for the next day because, especially in, like, a split schedule, too, uh, if you're shooting first thing in the morning and you're one of the first shooters, then you don't have yeah. time to prep. You need to be ready to rock yep. right away. So taking the time when you, you have when you get back from the match to just do a few things and, you know, a few minor cleaning, lubing, and then just checking your mags, loading mags, and you're you're ready to go. Then you're less stressed. You can focus on stage plan, not making sure your gear needs to be ready. You know what I mean? Do I have enough mags loaded for this stage and then the next stage? You know what I mean? So That's another thing, too, I'd like to do is just invest in – so many magazines that I can just have them all loaded in the beginning of the match and not have to reload mags. Just grab another one. Yep. It's a smart way. Yep. Yep. Now you're in uh, Freedom Town. You can do that. Mm. Yep. Sure can. Uh, for me, it's going to be, um, I say this all the time, and you guys got to hold me to this since you see me every day, shoot some damn sporting clays. Because mm. uh, I knew that uh, the Cody um, uh, shooting range, shooting complex, has a sporting clays component to it. So I know that those um, – those big clay machines are available to Pete. Yeah, they get incorporated. I knew he was going to use yeah. them, uh, but I did not practice for it. And uh, I think I took uh, at least 10 seconds of penalties on that. Yeah. So um, that is all on me. So I need to do that. The other thing, um, I got to say, I'm, I'm pretty pumped about uh, my rifle shooting because I was concerned. We didn't exactly plan a whole lot of time out because product is like at a premium right now. So. We uh, we ended up with um, a couple of our demo rifles, but I shot rifle really well. Uh, Steven, you shot rifle really well. Nice. Chad, you shot that stage great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My one stage. <laughs> but uh, so the so the gear held up there. I just want to get more time behind that and then, uh, you know, know my dope at, at longer distances, which actually was um, pretty close to another rifle I've shot in the past. So I'm pretty excited for that. Um, but I was, I was grateful that the – that everything went smoothly with that because switching a gun two weeks before a match is a little tough. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, that's on my things to do for the next year. All right, real quick here, final thought or piece of advice for the audience, Stephen. Uh, final thought. I think we pretty much covered everything I needed to yammer on about. But um, yeah, definitely you know, want to practice more, get better at three gun. What was just the one in general. You, what was the one you said yesterday? I said say that tomorrow. Uh. I thought I already said If you're nervous about shooting your first big match. I think you remember what I say more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday you said uh, that you're glad you, you went and did it because, you know, shooting a big match is intimidating. Yeah. But going out and doing it 
it was was worth it, right? No doubt. Okay, no not doubt. to put words in your mouth, but that's what you said yesterday. I believe you. <laughs> Chad, you agree on this? Yeah, absolutely. I say don't don't ever be afraid to shoot shoot a major match. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's because I certainly was for my first one. Yeah, it's it's kind of a big deal, but it's it's also a lot of fun. You get to see a lot of things too. I think. Uh, you know, seeing the people there too is a lot of fun. Like we were, when you guys were shooting uh, one of the last stages there and I came down to the truck to grab something out of there and a car pulled up and the competitors got out to go shoot the next stage. And it was Jerry Michelek and Kay, you know what I mean? So it was like, it's cool to see that, you know what I mean? As a, as a fan, you know what I mean? Uh, of the firearms industry too, getting to see people that you used to see on TV and, and on YouTube and videos and stuff from different matches, getting to see them in person. Like it's, it's pretty yeah. cool. So. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's definitely a big part of it. And the other the other part is like the you really get more out of it than you would have missed, you know. Definitely. So, uh, so definitely go shoot your first big match if that's on your uh, on your agenda. Yeah, I think what I was going for when I forgot what I was even talking about <laughs> was, um, <laughs> yeah, just don't be afraid of going out there and trying something new. I mean, going to your first match ever is probably just as daunting as going yeah. to your first major match with at least a couple of. Local matches under your belt. Yep, but um, every every step is a little bit scary. Yeah, so but it should be going. right. Like, yeah, it, it means should. you care. It means exactly. you're not going out there and negligently, you know, throwing yourself around. Like you're there to Absolutely. perform and and do the best you can. Absolutely. All right, Chad. Final thought for the audience. Um. Well, I was thinking on the same lines as that. Basically, just uh, you know, get out there and try it. You know what I mean? Don't be afraid to go go travel for your first major match. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? If you don't have them close by. Club matches are great. They're they're a lot of fun, and you get a lot of experience and try out new gear. But major usually matches half too. Day. Yeah, yeah, usually half day. But major matches are fun too, and just trying to make more of a, I think make more of a vacation out of it too works really well. Take a long weekend. You're going to be there for at least three days, so take a couple of days before or after too, and you know make a, more of a trip out of it. Some of the most fun. You know, trips I've had were, you know, traveling to Northwest Multigun uh, with all my buddies, and we went to get an Airbnb for like a week and go there. And this is kind of a, a guy's weekend, but you get to go shoot shoot guns and go, um, you know, do the thing that you love, the sport that you love, kind of a yeah. thing, and um, you know, make uh, make the most out of it, make memories. Those are some of my most favorite favorite memories from shooting. I think are those those big long matches where we took a whole week and. Um, you know, took the time to, to go shoot the match, but also go have a vacation and go kind of see some other things and see the sites wherever you're at, you know, use it as an excuse to travel um, and check things out. So, yeah, we got really, um, I guess, made the best of a bad situation because of COVID. Yeah. You know, of course, we couldn't have a prize table or anything like that or an event afterwards. So we actually got to go over to Yellowstone and check yep. out uh, Old Faithful and yep. Yellowstone Lake and all, all that stuff and see some turkey. Yep. Yep. <laughs> big big turkeys. Big turkeys. They're huge. Oh, well, they're national park turkeys. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. didn't buy that one? Okay. No. Uh, -huh. uh so my final thought I I would say is uh um it's great to be back shooting again. Um I missed a lot of the first part of the season because of COVID and stuff like that and uh our travel restrictions, but um it's good to be back. It's good to see everyone again. Um we as stag um are very grateful for the 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 people that are out there that are actually shooting the matches uh we did sponsor this match and i can't tell you how many thank yous that i've gotten for for that uh more than any other match so uh seeing this now from the the industry side um it really does go a long way so thank you to all the people that uh said hello and shook our hands and and uh said it was great to see us and we're happy we're in wyoming and I mean, it was just a, a wonderful experience. So that does bring up something for me too. So mm -hmm. being being in the industry side of it and sponsoring the matches, I cannot tell you how awesome it is to get emails and social media comments and stuff from people that attended the match just to say thank you. Yep. Uh, that's the stuff that we take back to to the the guys with the checkbooks. You know what I mean to justify this kind of a thing. So if you are a shooter in a match, uh, please make sure to to say thank you to the sponsors. Uh, in person is great too, but emails, uh, social media posts, that kind of stuff, that goes a, a long way into uh, helping you know justify for the companies to attend these events. Um, you know, because it's hard to it's always hard to show like ROI in that. We know we need to do it, we want to do it, but it's 
it's hard to you know justify it sometimes but yeah it makes it really easy to do that if you can say well, look at all the thank yous we got from this you yep. know what i mean we got all these people commenting on our facebook page all these people commenting on instagram we got people sending us letters sending us emails you know what i mean just just a quick thank you uh to the sponsors to a match goes a long way so don't don't forget to do that for uh any of the matches that you go to uh just send a quick thank you to all the sponsors yeah for sure and you know i i know that i make buying decisions based on uh who sh sports are shooting sports but that's quiet. Like people can't see it. You yeah. know, Like you were yep. saying, for the people who write the checks. So yep. definitely make some noise for the uh, the people that uh, yep. are sporting. One of the, the things that I used love. to do too is um, like we would do coupon codes for some of the matches too uh, when we were at Arrow, and uh, I'd go on there and look to see you know who actually used it. And it was really cool to see like people that would use the coupon codes like the first day that you you announced it at the match, especially if you didn't post it out on social media. Some of it was just like a coupon code in like the shooter's bag. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. to see them get it and use it like that night was like an awesome thing because the, you know, the, the marketing teams and the people that are, um, you know, sponsoring the match are running, helping to run that for the, the company. Like they see that stuff, they track that stuff and it really, it, it helps validate it. You know what I mean? It means that yes, we're doing the right thing and that, uh, you know, this is, is working and it's worthwhile for the company and we need to keep doing it. So. Absolutely. Well, dudes, uh, it was great first match shooting with you guys. Looking forward to many more. And uh, I think we should do uh, these little wrap-ups when we're um, on the next one we shoot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Thanks for being on the 3-Gun Show. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Thanks for having us. All right, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the 3-Gun Show. The return again. Number 287, the 3-Gun Show podcast. I appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Uh, for those of you still sticking around for this feed, yeah, we do have more podcasts coming. Uh, met a person doing a similar journey to me uh, that you'll hear from next week, uh, which is uh, Taylor, and you'll hear from her on the podcast. Got a Jeff Kirkwell Memorial 3-Gun podcast coming up, as well as Tactical Games, probably Generation 3-Gun, all kinds of good stuff. So thanks for listening to the uh, podcast. See you on the range.